so all of my talks this year, and I guess all of the talks really, are going to have a pre preface of being the light. My talk title today is Being the Light, Three Portals to God. And in a sense, what struck me as we were meditating is that all I'm doing up here is attempting to be the light, allowing the light to flow through me, and allowing that to touch you so that you become aware and remember that you too are the light. So it's simply light connecting the light, if you will. One of the simplest ways, perhaps, to speak about the divine is to talk about it as energy. I was thinking, you know, all those books for dummies, the divine for dummies. <laughs> it just boils down to being the light, being energy. And energy is, after all, the creative force. It has many qualities. It can't be destroyed. It's renewable. It transforms itself. It transmutes itself. It's powerful. We know that. It's intelligent. It's also intuitive. It's emotion. It's energy in motion with a purpose and a direction that we can follow. And it's at the very heart of all life. We could also use another word, perhaps, for all this, as I said, and simply name it light. If we could see the universe as it actually is, what we would see is simply light, just moving, interacting, connecting. And perhaps one of the simplest statements of Jesus is also the most profound. You are the light of the world. Literally. You are the energy of the universe. You are the energy of life itself. Something which scientists are claiming more and more to be the truth of this quantum field that we find ourselves in. And that it's the truth about all life. All life is made of light in its most basic and essential form. We are essentially packets of light intelligence carrying information in the light stored in the cells of our bodies and in particularly in our DNA. We know that. There's all sorts of information stored in the bits of our DNA. You could say we are light then in continuous motion. Right now, as you're sitting there calmly, there is an electrical storm of activity going on inside of you with neurons firing, receiving and sending electrical impulses that cause all sorts of chemical reactions, stimulating thinking, feeling, impulses, sensory reactions. And all of this is happening in a nanosecond. All of this being more powerful than the fastest computer that humankind has come up with, while managing trillions of computations instantly to maintain our homeostasis, our balance, our well-being of mind, body, and soul, and healing us healing things that we don't even perhaps know have been healed. That they've been outside our consciousness, and yet our body has fended off bacteria and viruses and God knows what else. We've no clue, because it's just doing this in the background, done without our even being conscious of it, and certainly without us being in control of it. And yet, it's possible for us to tune in to this energy within us as the light. And if we were to look beneath the surface of our skin and within our experiences and interactions in life, 
we would become aware that we are an incredible mystery of thinking, feeling, and sensory impulses. I mean, you could, you could break life down and, and look at it that way. That's all that's ever going on is consciousness, thinking, feeling, emotion, sensory impulses. And this creative life force communicates with us through our three energy centers of the head, the heart, and the gut. Through our thoughts, our feelings, and our intuitions. This is the intercom of life. Our feelings, our thoughts, our impulses. This is how the mystery unfolds and communicates with itself. This threefold interaction is the mainstay of life and it's the mainstay of what we would call consciousness. And it is therefore inherently sacred. Do we think about that as being sacred? As we experience them, our, as we experience our thoughts, our feelings and impulses, do we stop to think, oh yeah, this, this is as good as it gets. This is life. This is divine life. It's sacred. It's holy. How many of you saw the movie Fantastic Fungi? If you get a chance, if it comes around again, do yourself a favor. I think it's probably in the top three movies I've ever seen. It, it was spellbinding. The cinematography was incredible. But it showed just at the level of, you know, fungi, fungi, whatever you want to say it, the interconnectivity of life. And of course they do it with this, you know, incredible graphics and CGI. And yet you get a sense just from watching those pieces of the movie of what we talk about all the time, the unity of life and of consciousness. Whether it's in the cycle of decay, which you know, a lot of what the movie was about was about how it helps to decay things. But also then, of course, how it restores and brings back to life. <coughs> and yet we have this ability to mistrust and to misjudge this whole experience and process, don't we? These very portals or avenues to our self-discovery can become stumbling blocks in themselves. We've been fooled by our erroneous, erroneous thoughts. Who hasn't had an erroneous thought that got you into trouble? <laughs> the way of mastery says everyone has murderous thoughts. Who hasn't been embarrassed by our baseless and deceptive feelings for or against someone or something? And who hasn't been duped by our misleading impulses or intuitions? Boy, I had a hunch that stock was really going to make it. <laughs> and it didn't happen. So what are we to do? I guess the one word answer is discern or discernment. We need to learn how to process all of these three energies, our thoughts, emotions, and intuitions, and to discern them so that we can know when to trust them. And that really only comes with experience. You know, so often in life, we want it to work without the trials and the tribulations. We just want to do this right away and have it work every time. But we learn that that's not how life is set up. But eventually, we do tune in, and our sense of these things gets better. And discernment only happens through the use of three states or tools. So what are these three states or tools, you're wondering? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> All right. They are the three S's. They are silence, solitude, and stillness. And these are three keys to uncovering the light within us, 
and discovering that the light has one underlying quality, that of love. Energy could be said to be love in motion, just as our thoughts, our feelings, and our impulses are also actually love in motion. Have you ever understood your thoughts, feelings, and impulses in that way? That these are actually love communicating and helping us? They are the essence and the expression of love in different energetic forms. Just stop and think for a moment about the great thoughts that human beings have had. Some of the great thinkers from the past, from Greek times, from Egyptian times, or Roman times, Aristotle, Plato, people like Einstein, who received inspirational thoughts that changed history, changed science, changed our understanding of all of the theories at the time, of humanity, of science, of the universe, just little impulses, electrical impulses, loving electrical impulses, sharing insight and wisdom with us. Or the wonderful impulses of people like Mozart that he expressed in musical compositions, in these intricate scores. Or the great feelings of love that someone like Mother Teresa or Gandhi had for humanity, put into loving service, and again impacted the whole history of one country, or who knows how many people around the world. Each of these energies has the ability to touch the lives of many people, to change the course of history for good, and in so doing uncover the depth of the soul and the soul's identity of who we truly are. And perhaps these three portals or avenues are the Holy Spirit whom Jesus promised would lead us in spirit and be with us always. I mean, what's with you every day? Your thoughts, your feelings, and your intuition the access points to our soul is in the silence, which I spoke about two weeks ago. And we add now today solitude and stillness. These are the tools we can use to hone our discernment of our life, of our identity, and of how to be the light in the world. Portals to the knowing that we are the light and how we can be the light. And for those of us who operate predominantly by using our gut, our body, our intuition, we require that we sit in the stillness. Stillness is what we need. Be still and know that I am God. This is one of the great mantras from the Old Testament. And at first reading, it might sound like an invitation to experience the infinite God. You know, like it's referring to this God out there. Be still and know that I am God, the big God out there with the big stick or whatever. But while that's true that it is the infinite God, it's actually more of an invitation to experience the intimacy of the inner God the I am presence that each of us is. Be still and realize that I too am divine in my core. And the I that is saying I, and saying I am, is actually the divine speaking in, as, and through me. And that means there is, in a sense, nothing to do to become our divine self. It's already there saying, I am. You see, gut people are always striving to do in order to feel okay, to feel good, to feel holy. That Old Testament statement 
And stillness itself is an invitation to get off the treadmill of self-improvement, of attempting to fix oneself or the world or other people, of always seeking perfection in oneself, in others, and external circumstances. Be still. Like you'd say to a child, can you be still for five minutes? <laughs> the universe is saying, can you be still for five minutes and just realize that everything you're striving for, you already are? It's an invitation to let go and allow the sacred self to reveal itself internally as who we already are. Can you feel the relief of that? If you can, then you're a gut person. If that doesn't register so much with you, then maybe that's not your center of energy that you predominate in. And this stillness is a counterpoint to attempting to control everything and everyone, <coughs> allowing for real freedom and release from the addiction of always trying to control oneself. Do you know how tiring that is? If you don't, come see me afterwards, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'm worn out from it, I can tell you. It invites us to realize we are life itself and we can trust whatever life gives us, wherever it takes us, whatever it's presenting itself as right now. It's the invitation for us to take our foot off the accelerator of our own will. Because what that is all about is pushing our will, giving our will more juice, trying to make things happen and happen in a certain way. And it's an invitation to come into the contact into contact with a greater will of the universe and of then simply just aligning with that which doesn't require a whole lot of pushing or pulling it's more like a tuning fork just tuning in to this greater tuning fork for those of us who are more attuned to the heart center feelings and relationship, that's where you get your juice, that's where you come alive. Solitude is crucial for unfolding our soul. Because you see, this is where we get lost. We're overextended in the heart space, always reaching out, grabbing onto someone else or a relationship or a feeling. And solitude is a correction for our overemphasis on connection and feelings and relationship and comparison because that's all part of it. We're always <coughs> comparing ourselves with others. And for the addiction to other people's approval, which is never satisfying. What solitude does is reconnect us to our true self. And only that is ultimately nourishing and dissolves loneliness. Once we are connected to our true self, we can bring that forward and we can share it in our relationships with others. But we're coming from a place of fullness, not from a place of clingy neediness. When we connect with our deepest presence we are reconnected with the divine essence that wishes to present itself as us, to live life as us. And for those of us who are thinking types and more attuned to the head center, silence is our path to wholeness. We need to quiet the mind and the inner noise the endless ruminating and searching for answers, for wisdom, for understanding. We need to stop the fearful worrying and anxiety that robs life of its joy. The endless distractions of busyness and planning. 
Silence invites us to listen and to be quiet, to quiet the mind so we may hear the divine speak within us and even as us. And silence allows for our fears and worries to come to the surface and to be released, to be transmuted, so that we can trust there is a bigger picture and a bigger plan for us based on our infinite, eternal identity that's already there within us. So these types of contemplative uses of silence, stillness, and solitude nurture our souls, allowing our true self to reveal itself, calming the body, the overactive nervous system, stilling the emotions, quieting the mind. They shine a light on our addictive patterns that obscure our true self, that obstruct our essence from emerging and block our connection with the divine light and essence in us. So these three practices, of course, are beneficial to all of us regardless of which energy center we may tend to favor. Solitude encourages silence and stillness. Stillness invites silence and requires solitude. Silence engenders stillness and helps us feel whole in our solitude. These are wonderful gifts that we have. You could say gifts of the Spirit. And last week I got an email from a congregant <coughs> who stated be because of my talk two weeks ago on silence that she had started a practice now in the morning of being alone in the silence and that she was already reaping the benefits of doing that. And so I would like to encourage all of us again, if we really want to be the light, then it's going to require a shift in our lives, a shift in awareness. Something has to change. If we keep doing the same old, same old, then we're not going to experience the depth of our being. We're not going to experience the light within us. We have to open a way for that to happen. So if you don't have a practice of being in the silence, and I'm talking, you know, five, ten minutes. I'm not talking even an hour or several hours. But if it's not your practice, I would really encourage you in this year of perfect vision to begin to do that. We need a, com a contemplative <coughs> practice to counteract the barrage of news each day that suckers us into the drama of our false selves, of the overactive mind, and of the fearful emotions, and of the gut clenching when we see all of this stuff in our news feeds. We can be the light in very practical ways by giving ourselves the <coughs> gift of silence, by learning how to be still and learning how to enjoy the solitude of our being, of our soul, the inner light of the divine. Sounds like a great deal to me. It's three for one. 